I want to thank Peg for this wonderful series. Thanks to my fellow writers. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed the readings. Jody, Gint, Jean. I look forward to your readings. Um, Christian, Renee, and Josh. And thanks to Bill, my friend, for coming to hear us. The gift horse theme is a perfect metaphor for my novel, Living Treasures. I'm addicted to the narrative arc, so I decided to skip around and read three short scenes instead of a long one. In my book, the gift horse is a baby. Be a human baby or panda cub. The mother doesn't get to choose when to have her child. Take this panda, for example. She has to nurse a cub in the dead of the winter when bamboos have died after mass flowering. What can a good mother do? She comes to the village and eats a chicken so that she can survive and nurse a cub. A young girl, her name is Bao, bears witness to this. She grows up to become a law student during tumultuous Tiananmen Square protests in 1989. She falls in love with a handsome soldier and gets herself into trouble. She's sent to her grandparents' house in the countryside to have a secret abortion. In this scene, she meets a village woman on the mountain. It's a rude awakening for a young woman who has lived a sheltered life. Rest in peace, soybean. Ball calls her unborn child soybean. She's sad to have given up a loved child in order to pursue a career. She bowed three times and started to weep. If you came to me a few years later, I would have carried it gladly. I was weak, baby. I don't deserve you. Alone in the deep woods, she cried with abandon, like a countrywoman at a child's funeral. A small boy said, hey, you? You are angel, hundred times better than me. Promise me you'll find peace and joy in heaven. What are you doing? This time, Bao heard the voice which had dressed her. She looked up and saw a disheveled woman wearing a hefty skirt. Her face was puffy and caked with dust. Her small hands cupped underneath the protruding belly as if were in danger of dropping to the ground. She looked anywhere between age 25 and 35, but her almond-shaped eyes were much younger. They were timid, yet vigilant and antagonistic. I asked, just what do you think you're doing here? Who are you? Bao glared the woman who was about her height. You shouldn't mourn dead people here, little sister. Is this your mountain? Your bad luck may jinx my little one. The woman stooped to point her white kerchief. Bao reached out a hand but found it unnecessary to stop her. The woman couldn't bend down all the way to touch the kerchief. As a swollen belly weighed her down, she grabbed the knees to maintain upright stance. She looked pathetic and helpless to be on her own. How many months are you? Just over eight months. A shy smile crept up her face. He's on the big side. Most peasants preferred boys to girls because the family needed men to work in the fields. Bao had to disagree with her. I would have liked a girl, she said. The woman eyed the knoll covered with white kerchief. Is she here? Sorbin was never born. Oh, did you lose it? I had abortion. The candid words gave out a sense of relief. She couldn't say to grandma, but she told a stranger. You poor thing. She came forward to touch Bao's elbow. Did it force you? Who? Bao frowned. The one child policy workers, who else? Bao suddenly understood the situation. Evidently, the woman was attempting to have a child outside of quota. She was hiding from the one-child policy workers. Bao had read stories in Liberation Daily about guerrillas who hid out to have extra babies. They were mostly country women who were under pressure to have sons. Some guerrillas hid in their relatives' homes until they gave birth. The idea of knowing someone who risked their life to have a baby in the woods for almost four decades, the Wen Chao policy had brought enormous suffering to Chinese families, especially women. The government tried to control the birth rate at all costs. Let's hear the justification from Chao. 
on Charles II, the book's villain. He reasons with the village woman, Orchid, before he attempts to abort her Fulton baby and then sterilize her. The bed jolted as Charles II sat down. She closed the metal headboard with both hands and shut her eyes. You bumpkins don't seem merciful Buddha even when you trip over him. He crossed his legs and made the bed squeak. Have some financial sense, won't you? Raising a child is a great burden. You have to toy ten more years just to feed him. Why do you hold the feudal idea that boy is better than girl? Daisy is cute. Daisy is Orchid's four-year-old daughter. She had no trouble getting men to look after her. With a boy, you have to give him some schooling. He won't help you much in the fields. Kander, with his bad knee, will have to slay for the family. The little empress is bound to have gigantic tantrums. Think about it. Can you really live with the son's family? Everyone knows girls are more affectionate and loyal. Daisy will take care of you in your old age. The boy can suck you dry and later submit to his darling wife. So old lady like you will be ordered about by someone else's daughter. Charles still was silent for a while, dragging on a cigarette. He might get suspicious if she didn't respond. A life is priceless, she raised her voice. You have no right to murder my baby. I'm doing a favor, giving you my sincerest words. He threw a cigarette butt on the floor and put it out under his heel. You'd be grateful to me if you were smart. City women your age don't pop out children like piglets. They take good care of their bodies. The, red, the bed board clunked when he stood up. <laughs> Look at the soldier with his slutty girlfriend. They know how to have fun. Don't you envy them? This year, the Chinese government began to phase out the one-child policy to favor the, so, to favor the new two-child policy. Do people rejoice at the newfound reproductive freedom? Well, people know not to trust the government. There's a warning on social media. If a woman fails to give birth to a second baby, the entire village will be subjugated to artificial insemination. At five years old, Bao felt touched by fate that she let a panda mother eat the family's ham. At 18, she aspires to become a human rights lawyer during one of the darkest times in Chinese history. How has she grown in the course of the novel? In this scene, she encounters a panda mother the second time. By helping the panda, she finds the courage to risk her own life to protect Oregon her less fortunate country sister. Angry roars startled Bao. There was a fur 10 meters away. It sparked heavily clawed. Animal droppings littered the area. She glimpsed the furry bell amidst the green bushes. The glaring sunlight might be playing a trick on her. She squeezed the eyes tightly shut. When she reopened them, the black or white bell whipped through the air. A round head perked up from behind the clump bush. She covered the mouth to stifle a shout. A giant panda raised his arms above his head, stretched, and yawned cavernously. As it rolled upon the ground, she stood in awe of its full figure. Its back was broad and muscular, the white of its coat striking in somber forest. Its round head had almost hypnotic effect as it lumbered closer and closer toward her. Suddenly it bellowed and raked the air with a paw, before she could hide, the panda turned his head and fixed his small eyes upon her. The black goggles made his eyes look wistful and sad. The panda gave agitated bleeding hunks, a strangely vulnerable and timid sound from so large an animal. She noticed his foot caught in a coy white snare. Since the wire was torn, the panda couldn't touch her. Bao drew closer. At first, the panda snorted my threats. As she took a few more steps, Give a peculiar chomping sound, teeth clicking and lip smacking, and show up my anxiety. When this failed to deter her, 
the panda emitted roar so explosive that Belle involuntarily turned to flee. In her haste, she bumped her shoulders against a tree trunk. Then she heard a gunshot, dull and loud like firecracker, echoing the valley. The pelt of the panda was worth a good deal of money to poachers. As if sensing the danger, the panda charged the bell. Its tech abruptly swallowed by the end of snare cable. It bit large slivers of wood from the tree, roared and swept the air in frustration. Take it easy now, big guy. In her pen pocket, Belle found a pair of foldable travel scissors. She began to cut the wire snare with the scissors. Her heart pounded and she was short of breath. But her hand didn't tremble. This could be the panda cut from her childhood. She wouldn't watch her suffer and be killed by poachers. Slumping against the fur, the panda scratched and paw flies off his face. She cut the old rusted wire that wound around the tree. The scissors pinched her fingers until they were sore and numb. She bent the half cut wire back and forth. The panda snorted himself, his head bobbing up and down. Finally, the wire broke open, and the panda was free. No one can foresee what a painful price Bao will pay to beget a priceless gift horse. Thank you. Thank you.